OJ Simpson is dead at the age of 76. And folks, when you take in the totality of the football greatness on the field, the celebrity, and then the aftermath, meaning his actions in 1994 and everything that's transpired and did over the next 18 months before the entire nation and the world, and then uh, the end of his life, I don't know that there's been a bigger story uh, since we've been here at the Voice of College Football. So we are going to sift through the complicated legacy of uh, the one-time USC, Buffalo Bills, San Francisco 49ers great. And uh, I am pleased to be joined by Matt Zemek from Trojans Wire. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. I'll start out by saying, Matt, since we just jumped on the air, that the first time I knew of O.J. Simpson at all, and I grew up in a non-sports family, non-football family, but I have such the personality that I can go from zero to 100 pretty quickly. I knew nothing about the NFL. I didn't follow sports, knew nothing about sports. And then in 1977, 78, boom, I was the kid that knew everybody's statistics, everybody's rosters, watched every game, was full throttle. On Thanksgiving Day, 1977, O.J. Simpson was on television, and we were gathering there with a couple different families, and one of the family's fathers, as I was sitting there, not even knowing what I was watching, didn't know third down from a field goal from anything at that point in my life, said, that is the greatest football player on the planet you are watching right now. And I believe he ran for 250 yards against the Detroit Lions. Uh, he was at the peak of his powers and his greatness on the field blew out a knee as he was transitioning to the San Francisco 49ers because that was a huge epic story that he was moving back home to his hometown team to resurrect that moribund franchise at the time. Now, there would be another great legend in the making a couple of years later that would actually carry that through. Uh, but he hurt his knee early in his San Francisco stay, only played about a half season. And Matt, I even remember a 17-yard run by O.J. Simpson in his final game was blown out of proportion to be like the greatest 17-yard run in the history of football because that was the last glimpse we were going to see of that greatness on the field because he did no longer had it. And so I really missed his football playing career, as I believe you did. Uh, and then we saw OJ as the celebrity with the big smile and the charisma and jumping over, you know, hurdling everything in his way to catch a plane uh, on the Hertz commercials. And then as an NBC broadcaster, and he just had this larger than life persona and charisma. Uh, and so when 1994 hit, and I was arriving home from my wife with my wife at the time to watch the second half, or I thought of the NBA Finals, and saw the Bronco headed down the LA Highway. And for a couple of days, even though OJ again he preceded me, so he was no hero necessarily. He did have that heroic all-American persona, and so for a few days, I just kind of denied it as I, I'm hoping this isn't true. I'm hoping that that uh, is not the case, uh, but certainly the evidence uh, led us in a different direction and his legacy is unique on the American sports landscape. Yeah. You know, one of the things I tweeted right after learning of, of OJ's uh, death is that I would expect ESPN to re-air that five part uh, O.J. Made in America documentary directed by Ezra Edelman, which I thought was absolutely outstanding because it's a very unvarnished, you know, just digging into the details of this uh, remarkable American life. And, and remarkable does not uh, imply praise. I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable in every way, better or worse. And of course, there was a lot of worse in that, along with the better, the things he did at USC, the things he did with the Buffalo Bills, uh, you know, the electric company, the 2000 yard season in 1973. Um, I would expect that documentary to re-air. And, and, and like that really is a good primer for anyone who kind of wants to reassess OJ Simpson, or, or at least wants to get the totality of the life story, not just a uh, 
a little snippet here or there, but really to look at the whole picture. So I would expect that uh, documentary to uh, to re-air. In terms of getting at what you mentioned, at least to a point about, you know, just how big a celebrity he became and just how much, you know, his that car chase and that trial riveted the country. I mean, like this has been studied and it's going to continue to be studied by sociologists and media scholars and, and, you know, the people who study culture and identity, because, you know, as we all know, OJ Simpson was a trailblazer, not just as a, an elite running back, you know, that, that 2000 yard season doing something that hadn't, uh, uh, previously been done, but he was a trailblazer as a, an African American athlete who very consciously cultivated an image, cultivated uh, relationships in and through corporate America. And if you don't have OJ a, as the pitch man for Hertz and as Arnold Palmer's friend and as you know this uh, dynamic, smiling, uh, articulate, well-spoken presence in the media, you know, you don't have the the outpouring of emotion and and the totality of blanket saturation media coverage such that such that we're cutting into an NBA Finals game involving New York and involving one of the great big man matchups of all time, Olajuwon versus Ewing. You don't get that if OJ Simpson hadn't cultivated that image over a long period of time. Uh, you know, let's 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 just draw the comparison very briefly to another sport, uh, you know, while OJ Simpson was cultivating his image uh, with corporate America in the 1970s and into the early 1980s, the NBA was viewed as just this drug infested den, you know, of, of uh, degenerate black men. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not calling them black men. I'm just like, that was the cultural perception that the NBA was just a house of drugs. And like, you know, the ratings were terrible, you know, NBA Finals games were tape delayed into the early 1980s. Uh, one time in 1979, forget about tape delay, they aired a live NBA Finals game, which started, I believe, after 11 p.m. Eastern time. It was Washington versus Seattle. They aired the, a, a Seattle home game after 11 p.m. in the East, after 8 p.m. in Seattle. Like the NBA was just tossed around like a rag doll relegated to just ridiculous treatment that we can't conceive of now but it's be it's because the reputation of the NBA and its African American players fair or not was just you know in the trash bin and that is a stark contrast to what OJ Simpson did in terms of cultivating his public image like I'm not that I'm not that drug using uh, you know, degenerate, uh, you know, ha half literate, barely literate, you know, NBA player. I'm this polished uh, salesperson who, you know, knows how to move around in the high places. You don't have the outpouring for OJ Simpson uh, and, the, and the intense national interest in his car chase and in his trial in 1994 on into the mid 1990s without the things that OJ did uh, with Hertz, you know, with other corporate uh, connections in, in at the end of his playing days and on into his media career with uh, NBC and also ABC's Monday Night Football. So that's part of a larger story. And people are going to continue to study how OJ crafted his image. He was kind of the forerunner for what Magic Johnson became. He beat Magic Johnson by a few years in terms of you know, being this African-American athlete who, you know, had this had street smarts in terms of projecting and cultivating a public image and associating with power brokers and, and making sure that like his glide path, uh, you know, off off the court, off the playing field could lead to various commercial uh, and media opportunities. Uh, what Magic eventually did in his uh, non-playing career, OJ beat him to it and really is the first and foremost example in the television era, you know, since, or at least I should say the color television era, let's put it that way. Uh, you know, like since the mid 1960s, OJ really was the trailblazer who staked out that territory
before other African-American athletes did the same. The only other athlete I can think of that had that level of popularity because of his post career. So I'm not comparing, let's say, Muhammad Ali, who certainly uh, achieved that or greater status worldwide. But talking about someone who had left the playing field and then was able to extend that persona and even magnify it to even beyond NFL audiences Joe Namath is the only person, in a sense, that comes to mind because of his uh, almost Peyton Manning type approach to uh, media opportunities and commercials. Uh, but OJ was certainly because of, and I know Joe Namath obviously uh, took his network of broadcasting gigs as well, but OJ was long lasting deep into the 90s, or obviously up until 1994 into the uh, the broadcasting and, and a prominent uh, fixture on NBC Sports that also cultivated that entire image and allowed people to see him in real time, live, uh, you know, showing off his, his personality. And, um, you know, that the portion of this, Matt, that I find interesting from people's interactions that we get here talking USC football. So we're broadcasting on the national channel. We're on the USC channel as well. And I understand the discomfort, the, the unsavory thoughts and feelings. Absolutely. I am right there with, with everyone else. The, the, the actions against uh, Robert Goldman and of course, Nicole Simpson uh, are beyond description and despicable uh so that is that is certainly the most important of all of this is human life however the inability of people to separate the evaluation of the football greatness to where when you see all-time great lists he is discarded where 30 plus years ago, he probably would have been ascending up those lists beyond his football greatness because of the likability and the persona and the uh, engagement with an, with an audience past his career. He's now suppressed. And I do my best to be able to separate those two evaluations because the football, he is arguably the greatest running back that's ever stepped on a football field. Well, Mark, I mean, you you make a very uh, important point and like a very weighty point. And, and I would say that, that just before I get into the specifics of, of, of what you said, like we have in America right now a problem with precisely that, right? Because like if you're associated with this guy or this party, or this ideology, a whole swath of the country is going to dismiss what you say as though just that the mere fact of an association with a certain group or a certain belief system makes you somehow less or unworthy. Yeah, we have to get past that because they're like whether I wear a certain hat of a certain team or a certain belief system. That doesn't change the facts about how good this guy was at a specific thing. So OJ Simpson, not the best human being, but as a running back, like he was really pretty great and pretty special. And the fact that you're not a good human being, like, you know, we get into this discussion uh, during the Heisman Trophy, right? You're like, this is, this is not an assessment of how good uh, a diplomat or a politician you are or how much of a humanitarian you are. It's how good you were at carrying a football. And, and we're not trying to say that how well you run with a football is the measure of how good you are as a person. It's how good you are as a football player. And these things get conflated and they and, and people people in, in this country, like if, if you if you're on the wrong side of an issue, the wrong side of an argument, yes, people get dismissed. So I think it's it's really important to note that just at, in terms of human beings and having honest arguments, honest discussions, we shouldn't be writing off half the population just based on uh, association. So I think it's worth just say, just saying that. 
But now to get into um, OJ Simpson, Mark, and, and relate that to college football discussions, a really good parallel is Joe Paterno as a head coach. You know, kind of the same pariah status after what happened with Jerry Sandusky at Penn State. Awful. You could even say monstrous. But just in terms of how good a coach Joseph Vincent Paterno was, like none of what he none of the bad things he did changes how good a coach he actually was at Penn State. So in terms of just like the integrity of an argument on, you know, on the merits, you know, how good were you as a football coach? How good were you, Orenthal James Simpson, as a running back? Yeah, like none of that changes. None of that should be diminished or altered. And that's not that's not an attempt to cape for these guys or to kind of like be a defender of these guys. No, it's just it it was what it was. They did what they did on the football field. And and if they were odious human beings, that doesn't change what they were on the football field. So all that all that preamble, OJ Simpson. When I sat down to do a, a USC all-time offense two years ago, so this was before Caleb Williams played his first game uh, as a Trojan, um, we, you know, the, all our college wire sites at uh, uh, USA Today were asked to do their all-time rosters, offense, defense, special teams. So I was asked at the, as the editor of Trojans Wire to do the all-time offense. And obviously, the, it was the hardest decision I had to make. You, you could also say head coach. You had to pick your top two. You had to pick your starter and your and your backup. Uh, so I had to lead. I had to choose from uh, Mike Garrett, Marcus Allen, Charles White, and O.J. Simpson. I could only I could pick only two. I had to leave two of those four off. Actually, Reggie Bush as well. So so five five amazing extraordinary USC running backs. I could pick only two, and. I had to keep O.J. Simpson. I had to have O.J. Simpson as one of my two. And the reason why I came down on uh, O.J. Simpson making the cut ahead of Marcus Allen, ahead of Reggie Bush, is that, you know, in, in O.J. Simpson's time, college football was a running back centric sport. And college football was a running back centric sport through the mid 1980s with Bo Jackson uh, and you could you could even say Barry Sanders in, in 1988, you know, through the 1980s, you know, pretty much until you had, you know, Spurrier and Hal Mummy and, and those guys coming in in the early 1990s to revolutionize the passing game and eventually transition college football into more of a spread offense sport where the quarterback eventually became the center of gravity. It, it, you know, in OJ's time and, and really on through the early to mid 1980s, this was a running back dominated sport. So game game plans on offense and on defense revolved around how do we free up our how do we free up our running back or for defenses? How do we stop the opposing team's star running back? And OJ Simpson owned the stage as a running back in a running back dominated era. And and that you know that I mean now you could say that Marcus Allen was the same, and it's a fair point. But O.J. Simpson, what, as great as Marcus Allen was at USC, particularly in his 1981 season, which was st statistically phenomenal, but O.J. Simpson won a national championship. Uh, he went through era Parsegian's Notre Dame team, so like there wasn't the same level of uh, mythology or challenge that Marcus Allen had when he played Notre Dame in the early 1980s. wasn't quite the same. Uh, and also O.J. Simpson's run against UCLA. It's the most famous play in the history of the USC-UCLA football rivalry, but also, and, and, you know, UCLA was good during Marcus Allen's time, but it wasn't great. UCLA was great during O.J. Simpson's time, and O.J. Simpson defeated UCLA in that epic 1967 encounter. Let's remember, for the younger fans in the crowd who might not be aware of this, that that was a that was a clash of giants. It was one versus four. Winner, you know, has the the path to a potential national title at the 1968 Rose Bowl. Gary Beban won the Heisman Trophy in that 1967 
season for UCLA. OJ won the Heisman the next year in 68. So Beban was right there as OJ's equal as a college football super duper star, uh, you know, in this battle of giants. And OJ makes that cutback run up the middle. The play started from the left hash up the middle, bounce left to the sideline, and then that big diagonal uh, cutback across the Coliseum field. And I've noted this morning already, Reggie Bush's touchdown against Fresno State in 2005, which in many ways sealed his USC Heisman, it had the same flight plan. It had the basically the same path as OJ's run uh, in 1967. So, you know, just I, OJ makes the cut for me as one of the top two running backs in USC history, just because while others, you know, were similarly great, OJ did it at the highest level when UCLA was at its height. He won a national championship. Uh, he checked various other boxes that Marcus Allen didn't quite check. And then in terms of Reggie Bush, Reggie Bush had Matt Leinert. He had Dwayne Jarrett. That USC offense was so diversified in terms of its attack points, how it could score, where it could score. In 1967, there was no uh, similarly potent USC passing game. It all flowed through OJ, and everyone was geared to stop him, and he dominated anyway. That's not to say that Reggie Bush couldn't or wouldn't have been able to dominate the sport in 1967 if we you know went into a time capsule and we you know uh, put reggie bush back then and we put oj in 2005 that's not to say reggie bush wasn't capable of course he was he, he was an amazing football player but but oj in that context in that time what he did it grade it lifts his grade to a slightly higher level so when i had to make the cut you don't you get to pick only two charles white was my number one and O.J. Simpson was my number two as the greatest USC running backs at the school that brought college football student body right. Matt, you mentioned that the, uh, the, the commencement of uh, color television in this country, 1966-67, is when the networks went to color television. So we're talking just a year or two later. And if you look up O.J.'s run against UCLA, yes, you will see it in full color. And so, yes, he did emerge at the right time there now and, and, and played for a national championship the next season in the Rose Bowl against Ohio State could have been back to back national championships for USC and OJ. And then most of us, even if we missed his NFL career, are most familiar with seeing the highlights from his days with the Buffalo Bills. And regardless of where you place him, in the hierarchy because his career was limited for a few different reasons. Number one, they only played 14 games then. So that 2000 yards folks needs to be emphasized in light of 14 games. So his per game average is still the greatest of all time. He did eclipse Jim Brown's record in 12 games and then was able to put a standard that Eric Dickerson, despite the total yardage figure of 2105, did not eclipse in 14 games or as a per game average. And then also, if we just looked at what we would consider the 10 or 20 greatest running backs of all time, with many of them, for as great as they were, they didn't necessarily have a distinct style or signature move or set of moves you put on the tape of OJ and people have compared him to Dickerson as I just did, because he was almost, I don't want to discount Jim Brown in any such way, but almost the first of a class that we've rarely seen of size, speed, agility combination. And he just glided down the field. He was the guy that looked like it was effortless and he's running past people and he would hit that crease and it was just it was beautiful to watch him run i i like the comparison with eric dickerson because eric dickerson he really i mean and, and, and you know this can get a little cliched in terms of like a fine-tuned engine a fine-tuned ferrari 
but really like in it, the, the analogy with a sports car really does fit that just the precision handling right the, the just the, the the ability to just change into a different gear and 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 easily maneuver around a curve i mean the, just the sports car analogy it really is appropriate and eric dickerson you know he was so big he was so large and yet just his change of direction and his ability to just very smoothly move into a, a, a different stride or, or, or and find a, a bounce out to a different uh, running lane like that. I remember that from Eric Dickerson so, so, so well from from the 1980s, that just the smoothness with which he made transitions and watching the OJ highlights of the cutback run against UCLA of his 80 yard touchdown against, you know, a Woody Hayes greatest Ohio State team ever in that 1969 Rose Bowl and also some of his NFL highs. I remember I remember I didn't watch it this morning, but I do remember the Bills played the Bengals at Riverfront. And there's a there's a highlight of OJ making some cutbacks in the rain and he just kind of slid for like 15 yards and he gets up and he runs in a in a, in a different direction. Like his change of direction while also being this big, strong, hulking man, uh, it, it really is remarkable how, how, how OJ married power and speed in a fluid, well-coordinated combination. Changing gears, Matt, do you remember where you were when you first heard the news during the 1994 NBA Finals? Well, I was watching the finals and here, 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 get this. I was watching the finals. My mom had a panic attack that day and she had to go to the, go to the hospital and she wasn't having a panic attack because of OJ. It just, it just happened to, to coincide with all of that. Uh, her father, uh, died three months earlier. And like, so she was going through a lot of complicated feelings, uh, in her life. So like that was a truly remarkable time. I had I, and I had graduated from high school um, just one month earlier in May of uh, 1994. We were planning a Europe a European vacation to see my father's uh, family in a in a tiny farm village in Czechoslovakia. My dad left Czechoslovakia um, right after World War II. Um, yeah, because of the, to, to, to flee from the communists who came in 1948, seized power there. So I've, <laughs> I've given you a little look into my Zemeck family history here. But yeah, so like that day, that Friday in June uh, of 1994, never going to forget it. And it's and then like the OJ became part of the story. But like my mom had a panic attack. We were preparing for a European vacation. My grandfather just died. 1994 truly a, a, a remarkable uh year it's part of why that uh uh june 17th 1994 espn uh 30 for 30 is right at the top of my list uh among favorite espn documentaries and i think it's well done but also it's very personal for me because everything that was going on in my life that is such a a vivid and intense part of my life story uh, 30 years later. And so uh, OJ, you know, fit into that larger mosaic. And that's another intriguing portion of all this when there are these type of life-changing events, or in this case, a historical event of because of the life that was lived and the career that was pursued, that we can then personalize these to remember where we were, when, what was going on, with us was it a difficult time in our lives was it a joyous occasion was it what was it and how did this impact us uh, at the time and you brought up the 30 for 30 or it wasn't a, a 30 for 30 yeah it was a five-part series it it precluded the um the 30 for 30 series um and at, they they do a, a really masterful job through the entire series as you noted but right at the outset they give you a look at, in terms of the sporting and news landscape of the country what was going on that day that was completely of course stampeded by this news but ken griffey jr hit his 30th home run on that day which was 
mid June of 1994, which of course the baseball season was headed toward its only strike cancellation of a World Series and the conclusion of a season. The World Cup was going on. I believe President Clinton was at the World Cup. Yep. Uh, we had a in number Chicago. Of, yeah, in Chicago. We had a number, of course, the Michael Jordan saga was playing out uh, in terms of him leaving basketball and pursuing a baseball career. And the NBA Finals, of course, minus Michael Jordan for the first time in four seasons was, was playing out. Arnold Palmer's very last round at the U.S. Open. And let's remember that O.J. and Arnold were buddies. That was part and that was a big part of O.J.'s commercial and cultural appeal. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's uh, yeah, it's a good programming call by you to to bring that back. Uh, and we'll see what uh, ESPN chooses to do. All right, Matt, is there any other direction you would like to take this? I know that you've got a lot going on and I so much appreciate you showing up and giving your perspective on this. I think that's good enough for me and I welcome uh, other guests and contributors to uh, continue the conversation. But hey, uh, just follow us at uh, Trojans Wire. We're going to post a, a retrospective on that 1967 UCLA run and some of other uh, OJ's other career highlights. We're not getting into the social commentary like that's that's really for the sociologists and the and the uh, cultural critics to do. Uh, we're we're just going to focus on uh, OJ at uh, USC, and I also on our Trojans Wire account we've posted our all-time offense, so you get to look through that. And also I posted our tribute to Charles White. So that's I think that's just kind of the final note for me is that now we just have six living USC Heisman winners. Charles White died last year. Now OJ. Uh, so you want to, you know, if you want to study up on Charles White, who again, like I have Charles White number one, OJ number two is my all-time USC running backs. You get to understand why I have Charles White at number one. So go to Trojans Wire, and look at our Twitter account where we're tweeting out some historical retrospective uh, articles this morning. And thank you, Mark, for having me on. You will not regret it, folks. Check out Trojans Wire on a regular basis with Matt, certainly concerning OJ's legacy and a USC football and athletics. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you. The great Matt Zemek, who does such an outstanding job on Trojans Wire, but also, folks, um, he joins us every Monday night and Friday night on the USC channel. So many of you are joining us on the USC channel. Uh, Matt joining us uh, for the Trojan Conquest show on Monday nights at 7 Pacific. And then the USC call-in show, which will be coming your way on Friday at 6 Pacific. Now we take your calls. I've left the link there in the chat. Jackson, thank you so much for your patience. How are you doing today? Oh, you're welcome, Mark. How are you doing this morning? I am doing just fine. What's going on? I, I will tell you, though, th this was out of the blue. Like, I was just like, holy Toledo. I was like, but I, I will say, though, I, I saw where Matt a little while ago talked about how we shouldn't, uh, as the saying goes, don't separate the art from the artist, you know, e even though the artist wasn't exactly a good person, don't forget like the art that they had, like, you know, OJ was great at USC, but people tend to forget also that he did great at the Buffalo Bills. Like matter of fact, he was the top player at the Buffalo Bills before Jim Kelly and before like Josh Allen. Yeah, I would have to take a bit of a deep dive to do that uh, comparison justice. But off the top of my head, I would consider him still to be the greatest Buffalo Bill of all time. Yeah. Well, and I know he had a pretty good acting career, but then like all that mess happened in 94 and, you know, he, he ruined himself with that career. So... But you know, I wasn't even born during during that time. So like my my closest um, expose to like June seventeenth, nineteen ninety four, was the 
ESPN 30 for 30 documentary and and the people versus OJ on FX from 2016. I'll be honest, when I was like watching the documentary several years back, it, it kind of felt like I was watching the real thing right before my eyes. It was like the closest thing. Yes, uh, I did not see the uh, the the latest one that you just mentioned, but uh, the ESPN, uh, and, and I mistakenly said it precluded the 30 for 30s. I guess it was the original 30 for 30, uh, but it wasn't. Yes, it was it was the original one. I, I do believe I was certainly at the network at the time when it was released. But uh, yeah, it uh, is captivating. Uh, start to finish just uh, takes you through the entire uh, life and ascension and the greatness on the field and then on into celebrity and then this horrific incident yeah it, it's, it's just uh like john said it, it's a complicated legacy as he put it yeah and i've i've phrased it that way a few times too. We learned of the news just as I was getting ready to go on for the Ohio State show. Uh, it was just seconds before I went live for the Ohio State show, and then I threw it at uh, Steve, Tony, and Kevin. And I used that word "complicated" a couple times as well. Although in another aspect, it's 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 not complicated in that the football greatness is unquestioned it's again and not that i'm going to be a defender of or get on a platform because there are certainly other soapboxes that are much more worthy but i don't understand people not being able to separate the two and when i see lists of all-time great this and great that had oj simpson not done what he did in 1994 he would certainly be considered one of the greatest of all time and people are just kind of want to want to ignore that push that to the side push it in the back not deal with it and you can make a very clear distinction i think and make it less complicated by just saying this is the player these are the achievements this is the greatness and if you didn't see it Check it out on YouTube. It's just the, the guy was uh, one of the greatest ever. And then, of course, we don't we, we have an idea of how he lived his life between the end of his playing career and what he did in 1994. That was much darker under the surface than any of us imagined because seeing the public persona and the big smile and the charisma. But then we can certainly evaluate what he did in 1994 as being just a beyond description, horrific action and thing to do. Uh, so that's, that's where I make the separation. Yeah. And, and you know, it, I, I saw where Matt was talking about the same thing a little while ago where he talked about, you know, Paterno and, you know, people thought about, you know, the, sandusky stuff and you know some people have tend to have forgotten the paterno like accomplishments like on the field but you know and and i understand like the off-field stuff is really bad i i, I understand but it, it was like i i it, it was just like good grief like it was some bad stuff happening then and 94 you know we're getting to the 30 year mark two months from now you know for june 17th um, yeah. What what was it like in June 17th, 1994? So I would say that there are probably five to 10 events that if you lived during those various times that, you know, everyone was captivated by. And of course, the most important would be 9-11. Uh, yeah. There's no way to eclipse that just because that's national security and safety and all of that. But beyond that, when you talk about the celebrity level, you know, there are just one or two events or deaths that that I would think supersede this. But beyond that, um, 
it wasn't, of course, the social media age, which, of course, if that happened today, oh, my word, uh, servers would be exploding. And I don't know what it would look like on social media right now if that was transpiring. But also I can compare it. Unfortunately, I'm old enough to, to compare it to, let's say, Elvis Presley's death in 1977, which the media coverage was crazy, crazy, but it was had to be limited because you could only watch, basically, it was just prior to cable television. So the cable television aspect of it in broadcasting 24-7 all the time, of course, doesn't come close to what we see with social media, but certainly was fairly new in that, oh, this could be watched all the time. People were watching it nonstop all the time, all night. You could watch it whenever you wanted. And that was fairly new and and really allowed this to be blown out of proportion as well and to captivate everyone. Well, and I know one of the commenters are talking about uh, OJ's attorney, uh, Robert Kardashian. Like, I... I I always tend to think about that, you know, mm -hmm. where like Robert Kardashian was buddies with him. And then, you know, he was just like, I, I won't quit this trial, but, you know, that that's going to cement his guilt. You know, like I, I always think about you know, watching that on the documentary because, again, it kind of felt like I was watching the real thing. It's like, wow. Yeah, that is a considering the Kardashians and how they, of course, became a media circus of themselves and a phenomena of themselves. And that connection is intriguing as well. Yes. I don't have a whole lot to add there because I, man, my, my memory fades, you know, 30 years ago, I've not really watched it other than the 30th uh, for 30 you know, it's it's been forever since I've really thought about that situation. I was working at a TV station. It was just at the outset of my broadcasting career. I was a sports director at a, a CBS station in Mississippi. Yeah, we just we just had it on all the time in the newsroom. It was just on all the time. And yeah, it was it was an odd uh, summer because we also had a baseball strike. Uh, yeah, the 94 strike. And uh, baseball, for anybody watching that doesn't think that that's a big deal, baseball was 10 times bigger than, than it is now. It was That was the sports news every day. There's a baseball strike. That's all that people in sports talked about for months and months and months. Man, the 94... Expos must have felt like the <laughs> 2020 Dayton Flyers in college that's, basketball. It's a good call on your part. Yes, the Montreal Expos, who had never won a championship, never have. Of course, their move to Washington certainly they then produced a World Series championship a few years ago. But yes, possibly the greatest team of all time that could not compete for a championship. Uh, best record in baseball. They ought to do a 30 for 30 on that. That that would be pretty neat. But oh well. Yeah, we should uh we should do a live stream here where we take people's requests for what they would like to see uh as a 30 for 30. It, oh, it's obviously go. that that series has gone way past 30. That was the initial intent, but there's like 50 of them. It's just a name. It's just a brand like the Big Ten uh, at this point. But uh, yeah, I can see that. So they'll probably have to name it like a 90 for 90. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Mark, thank you for having me on and uh, hope you have an awesome day. And uh, may the rest of Thursday be an awesome one. Thank you, Jackson. I appreciate it. It's our guy Jackson. We appreciate Jackson stopping by to share his thoughts. Uh, was not around, but uh, Jackson certainly uh, in tune with sports history for sure. So I am going to check out the chat. We have left uh, the link. And if anybody else wants to join to share 
their thoughts about OJ Simpson's passing. I made a statement on the Ohio State show, and maybe I'm wrong in making this statement because maybe it's just me projecting on everyone else, but I certainly think I've seen enough comments through two shows about it, and it's not hard to make this assessment that uh, celebrities pass away every few days, depending on your definition of a celebrity. And there are various responses to that. Certainly some people become fans and are uh, saddened by those passings. And then for myself, with most celebrities, I can't think of the last time uh, a celebrity passing moved me in any such way. But anytime I hear of anyone uh, passing away, it strikes me uh, a certain way and it and it saddens me in terms of that that is a life lived and it was ended on this day and but uh, this one hits people i believe much differently because of his actions in 1994 um and i will stop short of going into a theological discussion about, uh, I saw some comments made about uh, his eternal destination. None of us know what that is. Um, so yeah, this is not a situation where had OJ Simpson either experienced the celebrity and the life that he did in which he almost lived from a public standpoint He, in a sense, lived four lives. He lived the football legend, football great. He lived that life through the end of his playing career. Then he lived the celebrity life as the movie star, as the NBC broadcaster, as the uh, commercial pitch man. And then he committed this heinous crime. And he then lived that for a couple years, being the most despised human on the planet. And then he subsequently drifted into obscurity. And that was kind of the fourth stage of his life, at least as I believe we see it. We don't know what was going on with him personally in terms of in his head and in his heart, but in terms of what was projected to us publicly, that's what I would consider to be the four stages of OJ Simpson's life. And so here we are, had OJ Simpson simply been a great football player and then drifted off into obscurity and just showed up at events like any football player from his era would show up on the David Letterman show every once in a while, show up on this show and that show and go to this event and that awards banquet and just show up and wave and make a statement. And that being about all we know of the individual, then we would be looking back on OJ Simpson as this is one of the, and again, his football career has been suppressed by his later actions. And I am not saddened by that because he brought that on himself, but I do think that that's inaccurate. He is one of the very greatest of all time. Had he played out his football career as he did that was cut short due to injury and then become the celebrity that he became with the movies, with the commercials, with the sports casting, and then faded off into obscurity. Then because that extended his career 17 years, basically from 1978 through 1994 until he did what he did. His time in the light limelight was extended far past anyone I can connect him to 
anyone in his shoes that was great athlete, no one came anywhere close to. And I, I cannot think of anyone since, and, and maybe I'm missing someone, but can we think of anyone who was the celebrity that OJ was for the next 17 years of his life after leaving the playing field and was that prominent in sports and just entertainment media. I can't think of anybody. Muhammad Ali was still enormously famous. Michael Jordan, enormously famous, but they didn't pursue activities to put themselves in the limelight and extend their careers. Peyton Manning, uh, but it's only been 2015 going on nine years that he has been uh, removed from football. And of course, with social media, there's so many more opportunities to do that. But OJ Simpson was a one of a kind in regards to parlaying a great football career into stardom as a celebrity, as a mainstream celebrity. People that didn't watch football, didn't watch the NFL, knew who OJ Simpson was. And most of them did because of him being a great football player. But if they didn't, they certainly knew who he was for the next 17 years as a just mainstream celebrity. I can't think of anybody who achieved that. So we could be talking about OJ Simpson passing away at the age of 76 as football legend, but most of us did not see him play, but we know the greatness and this is sad. He's an old man. He passed away. Had not all these other things happened and had he not committed what he did in 1994 or the best conclusion for OJ Simpson would have been all the stardom, all the celebrity, all that we thought he was good guy, charismatic guy, guy with a big personality, likable guy, and then faded off into the sunset. Then you would have 17 or 18 more years of life and career on the national stage. And then many of you would have been more connected to his career because of that. And then if he would have faded off and not committed what he did, then we would be looking back at OJ saying, oh yeah, there's a few of us that remember his football career and how amazing he was, but we can all see it on tape and see the stats. But most of us lived through the celebrity and yeah, he seemed like a great guy and all this. And we would be looking back fondly on OJ Simpson, American icon, American hero, because he was all of that. Now, he wasn't all of that because we have since found out not just what he did in June of 1994, but the type of person that he was, of course, that led to that. And we come to find out that many of our icons and heroes in this society are not what we think them to be. Yes, there's the image and then there is the human. And those are typically far distant and separated from each other. We do appreciate everyone being here at the Voice of College Football. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, we will continue throughout the day. And we believed this to be important and historic enough to go live with all of you. And thanks, so thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Uh, we've got a new show launching. That new show is launching next Monday. So let's give you a glimpse of what this is going to look like. Note the Voice of College football logo with a complete different color scheme and the happy little sunshine guy up in the left corner. Wake Up College Football comes your way starting next Monday, April 15th. So lighten up your tax day by joining us at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. 8 a.m. I will be up. 
I can promise that at least one eyelid is going to be open and we will be joining you at 8 a.m. Eastern time, Monday through Thursday, and then most likely on into Friday as we close in on football season for wake up college football. So be looking out for that. It's going to be a much different show than anything you've experienced here. The voice of college football. We've got a caller coming in here. Sean joining us. Sean, how you doing? Hello, I'm doing good, Mark. Sorry, I'm for the lighting. I'm in a different than the normal, but hopefully this isn't too just the darkness isn't too distracting. Maybe it's appropriate for the topic at hand. Okay. Yeah. Sean, before you go here, so Joseph makes an ignorant comment here. Mark, you're glossing over so many atrocities. I don't know that I can convey stronger words as I have a couple dozen times than despicable, uh, unthinkable, all the other adverbs and adjectives that I've used. I'm not here to break down a murder. We know what happened in 1994, Joseph. So I'm not glossing over anything. I'm separating the career. So I think please, please understand you are. when you make comments that sometimes are made out of ignorance. All right. I think what Joseph's referring to, there is a string of uh, violent involving OJ before the 94 incident. Yeah. A number and of I just incidents. stated that a couple minutes ago. I, I think yeah. a lot of people get on these shows and live streams and so forth. And I made this comment about something completely different uh, on our Ohio State mm -hmm. show. I think people don't listen. I think people, they they think they hear what they heard or they heard like one fifth of what was said. And then they make comments and have feedback when they're not listening. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I did mm -hmm. state that his I used the term dark. I said he had the very dark. I said, while we were seeing persona and celebrity and a smiling face and an articulate man. He had a very dark uh, private life. Yes. Yeah. I uh, I don't exactly know how to process this. I've felt, I think, you know, just about nothing over this news. Like, I, I mean, it, it's just, it's not like I'm ignoring it. It's, I've consumed, uh, the unhealthy amount of OJ content through my life. I'm very familiar with his life and his playing career and his acting and growing up in San Francisco. I know a lot about the guy. I, I, I at once find him to be kind of an and I mean, and I mean, striking, captivating, just what he went through in his in his life he grew the era he did and as a black man and as racial politics changed as drastically as they did growing up and and he he's been you know at the center of it the whole time it, 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 he's kind of interesting to me is that i think he went from being something of a pariah in the black community to almost being like a martyr of it and then reversing back again. Yeah. You know, I mean, he, he was, he was definite, he was the definition of what some people sell at one point in his life. I mean, he tried, he, he stayed away from, uh, from politics and stayed away from controversial issues. He wanted to be as anodyne as color free of reality was, you know, he hung around almost exclusively with white people and then it happens and then because of media coverage and because of the defense uh, attorneys techniques i mean race got really pushed uh to the forefront of this and, and it's kind of weird his whole life trying to be like a figure of those kind of politics or, or at least separate and in the end he ends up being like one of the most prominent figures in that discussion so yeah and they do a nice job in the you're you're reviving some of my thoughts and some of my remembrances of i haven't watched that 30 for 30 since it came out and i don't remember 
I can tell you what 19 year span it came out in because where I was working, but I don't remember when it came out. Uh, it was like right around the 20th or something like that. 2014, 2015. 2014, 2015. Right okay. around that. I yeah. I would have guessed longer ago than that. Wow. That seems like forever. Uh, <laughs> that was only nine or 10 years ago. So yeah, my, my recollection of, of it, but I, I do think that they did a good job of crafting everything you just talked about in regards to how he approached his career and was very cognizant of who he was and what image he wanted to portray and how he was viewed by the black community. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a master class in sociology and race relations and public mm -hmm. perception and all of that. Yeah, yes, it, it absolutely was. And, and, and when we talk about like, you know, so the accomplishments he had before, I mean, like, it doesn't seem like he did should actually diminish. I can't help but uh, not, I can't help but not being affected by everything we learned about him after 1994 affects everything. Like, sure. I love the Naked Gun movies. I, those are, those are, I still find them hilarious. I find them great, but I have a hard time watching mm -hmm. the scenes with him in there. Since scenes with him down in a, a wheelchair, like it just, for some reason, I just, mm -hmm. hard for me to stomach, hard for me to see him in any other light than what we learned about him later. And that, I mean, obviously, you can't blame like the Zucker br brothers for casting him. No, in that, but no, not at all. Not at all. We were all shocked at his, mm -hmm. uh, at uh, what, what became known about him. Uh, although, as was pointed out in the chat, and, and you as well, and I didn't see all of what led up to that in terms of the physical abuse. And that was all on public record, but it was so well suppressed. Uh, I don't know that that was largely known. No, I mean, I mean, I, well, I, I certainly really, my first memories, some of my first memories period are of that trial. That's like about the age I was, you know, five, six years old when that happened. I, I have like a faint time being a sideline reporter for NBC during a Notre Dame game before then, but yeah. So, so I lived through I mean, all of that and consumed as much yeah. media as just about anybody. And people mm -hmm. weren't aware that, that he abused her and didn't see those mm -hmm. pictures and those reports and none of that. I don't know how that would have been suppressed. Of course, we didn't have social media. We did have cable TV and all these have, news. You didn't, have, you didn't have TMZ or, you know, the Daily Mail or anything yeah. that are you know, snooping by looking to find. Yeah. I mean, you did have like some paparazzi and stuff, but it was much easier to conceal, you know, malicious behavior back then than it is now. But no, I mean, it, it's amazing. Like that's, that's the first uh, sort of big celebrity trial I've ever experienced. And so I, I was so young, I didn't realize like how, unprecedented there's been no trial even close to that scope of public interest since then that i can really recall no criminal trial i've just one i can think of is the uh johnny did heard happened a couple years i paid no attention whatsoever but you know i i, I grew up and the, I this was just kind of normal like you had big people were paying attention to that the whole country was captivated by the verdict and that never has really happened again since no not that, so, not that and, and again i i don't I, I try to understand that the, that a lot of people are interested in things that i'm not and there's a lot of celebrity things that go on that i could care less about and don't take part in that doesn't mean that they're not huge to masses of people but i i just can't imagine that anything's right come close to uh, the magnitude of his trial. Yes. And, and so, and then, you know, like you said, he, I, I mean, he only like further diminished his after that fact, 
after the trial. I mean, you know, making making some dumb statements, you know, doing some terrible things afterwards and kind yeah. of losing his mind and all of that. I don't know if there's ever like repaired it back into uh to get him back into the public's good graces, but he aggravated his legacy. Well, yeah. Tremendous. Uh, over the, over the next 30. Uh, I think we're getting what you're saying, Sean. You've been cutting out the entire time you've been on. So I'm, I, mean, I think I'm, I'm getting it. But basically, yeah, I, I can't recall specific statements that he made. But, yeah, there were there were all sorts of incidents, you know, in the next 10 to 15 years in which, yeah, he... he he would make yes, just completely ludicrous statements about um, wanting to find out what happened and and all of that. Yeah, again, my my memory's fading, but yeah, he would pop up every so often with some type of interview in which he made himself look even worse, if that's possible. Uh, Well, I mean, yes, like he just cemented uh, what the public had already thought about him uh, through the years. And, you know, it would be interesting, like if this was just if he had just this one terrible, horrible incident, it was a real moment of rage and out of character moment. Hmm. It, it, act, no matter how big of an act, it is, how awful of an act it is, I don't think one one instant moment should find a person's life but it's also everything else learned about him that just said no no it, it it shouldn't define a person's life but in this case it still would have even if he would have done nothing yeah. or not been heard of since um but for somebody to commit that action i don't think i don't think you are of a loving, kind heart and of right mind. And then all of a sudden you flip out one day and then that's what you do. And then you revert and become the lo loving, kind person the next day. I, I just don't think that that's possible. So that's just, that was just the culmination of who he was. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. <laughs> a certain case, but I mean, make mistakes in our lives and, I imagine there are good people who have done some really terrible oh, things. Absolutely. And absolutely in, in their life. And I and I I I don't think it should necessarily wipe out all the good they did. But yeah, in this case, like he doesn't really deserve I don't think he deserves any grace from anybody. You know, and and, and in fact, I mean, I I think some if you reflect on it uh anymore, you should have a little bit of a of awareness you view these people that you don't know on a mm -hmm. level, how, how much you them because they do something really well really well that you enjoy watching yes i mean that, that that's just i mean you we should be examining things like this the public thought they knew who oj was they thought they knew him on a fair on a you know fairly deep level and it turns out none of us did at all yep. so no it's 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 a great point and i try to make that statement even when i'm just commenting about coaches as people and mm -hmm. state okay based on everything i know everything we've seen everything we mm -hmm. hear i don't know the individual personally but i do evaluate them based on what we know where they seem to be a decent person, caring of their players, et cetera. But I don't know. Yes, none of us know. And if, if we knew, I, like I've got, a, I've got a buddy who loves to consume classic TV, classic movies, is very knowledgeable about it. We have a lot of conversations about, you know, we saw, you know, we saw this guy on Perry Mason. He's the same guy that you see on Happy Days 10 years later. You know, those kind of conversations. And, uh, he wants nothing. He wants no knowledge of anyone because he's just, he has been disappointed and has detested what people truly are uh, 
behind the scenes that he just doesn't want to know. He doesn't want to hear any of it. Yeah. And there is something too, like certain types of behavior are actually more common. This has been like psychologically proven in highly successful people, like more sociopathic behavior Hmm. or, you know, like, you know, more manipulative behavior, something sad. It's a sad reality, but that's, you know, the way it is. I mean, it's it's not easy to get to the thing. And sometimes you have to break a few bones on your way there. So, yeah, I mean, it's. Well, to a certain extent, we see it with these athletes that are put on a pedestal. And when I say athletes, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about, let's say, the best of high school football players, the recruits. Mm-hmm. And I'm not calling them out as bad people by any stretch. This is not their fault. But when you live in kind of a, and they, and they do this to a very limited uh, extent compared to some of the people you're alluding to and OJ yes. Simpson, we could talk about rock stars that are so live in a world in which they are just catered to, to the nth degree, the fanaticism around them is so heightened. It's, it's just not a healthy situation. It's not mentally and emotionally healthy to live like that. No, no. And the types of people that would seek out that kind of lifestyle, you know, they, they might be more prone to more narcissism and, like I can tell you this, I have no to have like the level of fame LeBron James does. Like that 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 has zero appeal to me at all. I mean, I I I I would think like living those kind of lives seem would seem like much more of a burden than that was yes. than it would be worth. I agree. So I mean, so I don't know, but I mean, like so yeah, that is just a present and. um and just just one final thought before I go. Um, be interesting to talk to uh, Tim and Matt and Tony to kind of you know examine their what his uh, legacy among the uh, the USC faithful is like how they view him like what's the range of points of view on OJ Simpson. I mean, have he's probably, Matt. We had Matt on for about oh, a half an hour at the beginning of the show. I did. So we okay. did get Matt's take. So that's that's worth a rewind because he certainly had some yeah. interesting perspective on it. Well, I mean, I, this is probably this is not an appropriate in terms of scale, but and I never saw Art Schleister play, but you know, obviously he's had a, a million issues and done a lot of very very bad things after leaving him. I don't know what you're you're at your thoughts and views on his legacy with the Buckeyes are I and that he was, you know, the best quarterback they had ever had at one point. So here's where I make a few separations. So Arch Leachter is my favorite Ohio State player of all time. And okay. this is where maybe I'm different than most people. I'm able to separate that. Like, first of all, I, I feel more bad for him, even though he's completely responsible and should be held accountable for his actions. I see it as more, this is sad, what happened to him. Uh, and I'm able just to separate being the, the 10, 11, 12, 13-year-old that watched Arch Schleichter play, and he's the only player that I've ever asked for a jersey. Uh, my girlfriend, several years ago, bought me an Arch Schleichter and a signed autographed jersey from Arch Schleichter. I couldn't tell you where it is right now. I'm not big into those things. It's somewhere. But uh, he's still my favorite Buckeye of all time. And I just separate those two things. But I think the bigger distinction, Sean, is, and I might be wrong. I'm going to put myself in the place of most people. I think most of us make a distinction between somebody ruining themselves and we consider that sad. Oh, what a waste. Look at what they did to themselves versus somebody who was violent and abused and uh, impacted other people. Yeah, I, I mean, the 
situations are very, very different from each other. And I absolutely agree. I, I, I view those things in different in different buckets too. But I just, but I, I have a hard time thinking of an exact other comparison to someone for our team. Oh, for I mean, our I'm sure team. there are some, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I mean, I'm, I'm sure if I browsed hard enough, I could summon up some prominent players who did some the, awful thing. The, the name that came to mind when Matt and I were talking about legacy and the confusion that people have, or just, I, I don't know if you heard this part of whether it was my conversation with Matt or me just stating this. I t completely agree with you. It's impossible to remove bias. So if I was going to make an all-time greatest running backs list, then I placed OJ third, seventh, 17th, mm -hmm. whatever. I would admit that in some way that is indiscernible to myself, there has to be bias that's in there somewhere based on yeah. what he did in 1994. Now, I would do my best to remove that, I, and I think I would be very unaffected by that, and I could simply look at the tape and the stats and place his legacy and rank him. I think I'm very capable of doing that. But for some reason, his name has just been completely taken out of sports discussions, football discussions, when it should be very prominent in greatest of all time and I don't know why people, I know it's uncomfortable and what he did off the field is so despicable that it can't be compared to playing football. But if we are simply having a football conversation, he has to be ranked and discussed as one of the greatest ever. Uh, but, but a lot of people just can't bring themselves to acknowledge that because of what he did off the field. And those to me are two separate things. And the name that came to mind as I was explaining that was Ty Cobb. Now we're talking about somebody that nobody ever watched play, had no connection. Yeah. He's just simply in the history books and we've seen pictures. And if you're a baseball fan, you know, he hit 367 for his career and all of that. And he might be the greatest hitter of all time, but, and I, and I, and I don't prove, in any way or promote myself to be an expert on Ty Cobb's life. But I think it's well documented that he was a racist, like a blatant oh, yeah. racist. And so he was the one person that came to mind. Even, for, even for the time. I'm sorry. What's that, Sean? Even for the time period. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Right. But to separate. And again, it's easier to do because we're so separated from his time and not having any interaction with what he sounded like, what he looked like in real time and all that. But I think most people distinguish his playing career from that. When I see yeah, baseball like, rankings. Even more than being a, a racist, he was just kind of a, you no, know, an despicable guy and like a yeah. replay. I like tried to hurt players on the field deliberately tried to take yeah. people out of the game and yeah he, he reminds he's also somebody like barry bonds a, a, a reputation of ill respect and uh in the world <laughs> known as yeah. being like an incredible a bad teammate not a good guy he certainly cheated of his accomplishments but you Neither one of them, I, I don't think, ever are accused of committing any heinous, heinous crimes like anyone. Yeah. But, but you know, it, it's hard. It's hard. It is hard for some people to appreciate um, their uh, their accomplishments on the field, the, the talent they had. It's not, you know, you know, Barry Bonds is not in the Hall of Fame. He probably never will be in part because he was just a gigantic jerk. You know, I think that's, you know, so, I mean, so I don't have much more to add. And if I keep cutting out, I apologize for that. Um, that's a really right, good conversation. We, we've got really another call, but I appreciate you stopping I by. Was, I was enjoying it. Take care. Thanks, Sean. Have a good day. Before we take this last call here, uh, 
there, there's a comment made in the chat, and this is I, I've seen this comment a number of times that we know that O.J. Simpson is not in heaven. Now, I'm not going to go through a big theological uh, discourse here, but we don't know that. We don't. And if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you know what I'm talking about. We don't know. We don't know because that's not the criteria for reaching heaven. <laughs> murderers, non-murderers. That. All right, Jeffrey's here. Jeffrey, appreciate you being here. Uh, hi, Mark. I appreciate you taking my call. But yeah, I agree with you 110. percent And I actually was going to come on to uh, say something similar to that. Was that I I've seen it all over Twitter about people saying that he's here. He, we don't know that. I agree with you 100%. I mean, there's no way that you can, you know, say it when you, we're all people that make mistakes. I mean, obviously, most of us will never make the amount of mistakes that he made, but we're not, you know, people that are perfect. None of us are. And the only one that was was the one that we celebrate on Easter and Christmas. So, I mean, it's the way that it goes. I mean, nobody can say that. So, I mean, I, I hate that. You know, he passed away. I obviously, and whenever anybody passes away, I'm always, you know, I'm sad. And I wrote rest in peace to him on Twitter. You know, I hate that he passed away. But, yeah, I mean, I think the bigger thing for me, it was just about, instead of saying where, where he is, like people always want to say, which is not for them to say, is more the fact that it's just sad that when people have, you know, everything going right for them in life, right? I mean, they've, they've made all this money. Everything's just going perfect for them. And then you just throw it all away because of stupidity. That's the bigger thing for me. Yeah. And maybe I should do that comment that I made before we brought you on a little bit more justice and explain myself mm -hmm. just a little bit clear. Although again, I'm not going to make this a theology class. We do have a Bible channel folks. So I read the, the it's word. It's really good. I'm just going to say it's Thank really you, Jeffrey. good. I appreciate that. You're and welcome. we need to do more with it. But um, it, the I don't know if the we may have the the link in the description section. But anyway, um, I'll just state it this way. Yes, God's and this is a very crude way of putting it. God's grading system, his his scale is much different than ours. And yes, if a person has committed murder and that goes unforgiven and unaccounted for, and there's no repentance. Yes, we, we know where that person's destination is. Absolutely. Yes, we do. But we don't know what that person has done with their relationship with the Almighty and forgiveness and asking for it and repentance. So if that happened, there was a thief who did much more heinous things beyond that hanging next to Jesus on the cross and simply mm -hmm. in the moment of dying asked for forgiveness. He's in heaven. I always called it one of the smartest moves in history. <laughs> I mean, you got he recognized lose, who was right? next to him. He recognized the other guy. It's, it's a great uh, mm -hmm. contrast. The other guy on the other side completely missed it and didn't mm -hmm. realize, but, that guy in that moment had enough awareness and knew who he, even though in the flesh, he, you would think, well, this guy, he must not be anything special. Uh, mm -hmm. But he saw past that and realized, and yes, a great call on your part uh, to, to just frame that as, yes, one of the, the greatest <laughs> decisions in a split second that you could ever make. For sure. It's, it's crazy too. I mean, like, based off everything that you know when you read the good book and know what's you know been said i mean it's just and what happened i mean it's just it's no, definitely a no-brainer i mean i just think like again when you have something like this because i mean obviously i've never watched him play and i, I was not alive for the chase and all that you know like my parents and you know older family members were they saw that i mean like some of them like legitimately were in walmart they saw it on all the tvs for sale i mean they were broadcasting that thing but but i mean i just i mean i pull up twitter and we know it's 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 not a great place right people are rude they're evil i mean on easter you saw obscene things that were tweeted about you know jesus and stuff it's just, it's insane it's it's the way it goes it, and it's like why but twitter is not real life but i mean you pull up twitter and i, I wake up and i see that he's, he's passed and then i just see all these tweets just dunking on the guy and i understand why 
That's just the way people are. And obviously those tweets are getting millions of hits. Like, wow, he's, you know, try, trying to get into heaven and like, he can't get in. Like you got all those tweets and like, I get all that stuff. People are, I'm a lot, some people are just joking around, but on the other hand, it's just, it's just not nice either. It's kind of inhumane, right? I mean, it's just the way that it goes. I mean, you just, Twitter's just evil. I mean, that's just kind of the way it is. Like just a lot of the stuff people say on there, it's just, you shouldn't say it. I get why you are and you're being funny and you're wanting hits. I get all that, but it's just at the same time, it's just, it should not be said. Absolutely should not be said. Yeah, they did. They just want hits and uh, you're, you're exactly right because if, if you are, if your intent is to point out the obvious, then mm -hmm. you're just an ignorant person uh, because everyone knows what happened in 1994. Mm -hmm. I've tried to use as strong a language that's acceptable as I can. Despicable, unthinkable, horrific, horrendous, mm -hmm. all those things. Uh, but to magnify that, talk about it um, in light of somebody dying, passing away. And I don't have any great uh, feelings uh, of sadness or anything, uh, except more sadness mm -hmm. about, of course, what he did. Uh, and then what his life became and what he was. And if mm -hmm. that didn't go, uh, if, if he didn't reconcile himself uh, with God, then then his life was obviously a complete waste as well. It's yeah, it's it's sad all around. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, and then you'll obviously have people on the other side of the spectrum. I've seen a lot of people say that he was innocent. I, I've seen people say that forever. And it's like, I, I don't understand that either because it's like he was not innocent. You know, I, I mean, you, when you have all the evidence in the world, just, I mean, I'm not even going to get into the obvious, but it's just it's just some people are going to defend people that whether they're a celebrity or just whatever, because an era football player, and, and it just it doesn't make any sense. I mean, like what you just said, absolutely agree with. I mean, I feel bad for anybody that passes away. I don't want anybody to die because you know how some people are. If they just really don't like somebody or don't like what they did, they're going to be like, I'm glad he's gone. It's like, why? I mean, you shouldn't want anybody to be dead. And then it's like, well, even though he did all those things, it's still sad. But then on the same token, you mean, you got to, you know, just state it as it is. I mean, he was not an innocent person. He ruined his life. It was absolutely dumb, but it's still sad that he passed away. And, but he definitely wasn't innocent either. So, I mean, it's just it's just kind of down the middle. That's just the way I look at it. You said something a second ago about trying to imagine what it was like then or not being around. And I don't want to link anybody else's name currently mm -hmm. to his name, so I'm not going to try to make a comparison. But just think about whomever that would be that would be the most popular athlete you could think of. And I understand he was 17 years away from his playing career, but because mm -hmm. of his career choices and because mm -hmm. he was so well liked doing the NBC broadcasting, doing the movies, doing the commercial, he was all over the place. So basically this is arguably at the time, the greatest running back or the greatest football player of all time, who then for the next 17 years stays in the limelight with a nice smile and he's articulate and everybody <laughs> liked him. Everybody just thought like, that's what was became surreal wasn't just that okay anybody did this but everyone just had this this perception of who he was and that's what made it you know for a few days and i was no big oj fan because again mm -hmm. i basically missed his career but you know it would be like somebody i'm sure you could come up with a few players that you just barely missed Mm -hmm. But you still know a lot about them and you watch the highlights and they and the, the highlights are so fresh, you just miss them. Like mm -hmm. if you started watching like in 2010, somebody that retired like in 2008, 2009, you mm -hmm. still know a lot about them and everything. Mm -hmm. And then again, magnify that a thousand times because the guy was on TV all the time. Mm -hmm. And P everybody liked him. I don't know anybody who didn't like OJ Simpson. So when this happened, I was trying to think of every possible way for a couple days that oh, hopefully this is just, mm. this is totally just not what it appears to be. And it, it, and of course that turned out not to be the case. And he turned out to be a much different person than, 
anyone knew. I mean, it's definitely true that you really don't know somebody just by seeing them on TV or, you know, like watching them play football or whatever, like a celebrity. I mean, you take like your favorite celebrity and people, you know, really enjoy that person. And then you somehow meet the person and then they're, you know, stuck up or you don't, you don't like them. I mean, it's just people aren't always what they appear. And, and that's, you know, that's a sad thing. And I mean, sometimes it's an isolated incident. I mean, somebody could be a really good person and then they just snap on something, something happens. I mean, maybe, maybe he was always really good. And then that happened. I mean, it just, it wasn't, and he was always a terrible human being. I mean, some people are just always terrible. It's just in certain situations, it's just the way it goes. But I agree. I mean, that'd be like today, you know, like after their playing career, LeBron James or Tom Brady or someone just super famous, just something crazy like that happened. I mean, people would go absolutely nuts because you just wouldn't expect it to happen. Just anybody super famous that doesn't because, yeah, I agree. Like, I've seen his highlights and, like, I mean, people love the guy. I mean, a lot of people still do. That's the thing. Again, some people still really do, despite everything. I'm like, how do you really like O.J. Simpson still? But, okay. But, I mean, it is what it is. But, yeah, I mean, it's just like every time something happens, like you, you even – you've seen probably the Rasheed Rice thing that just happened, right, with with the Kansas City Chiefs wide receiver. And you had Henry Ruggs a few years ago. Just when these players do things like this, I mean, you're just ruining – your career it's like why i mean you have everything going for you i mean at least with oj simpson like he it was way after but why ruin your career while you're still playing so many they just make mistakes and it's just dumb you, yeah just to I, clarify one thing uh there there was a long line of physical abuse and everything mm -hmm. and, and as i was stating i don't know if you were here at the time uh, mm -hmm. because of the lack of social media and mm -hmm. the type of reporting that we have. Although I don't want to make it out to be prehistoric times. There was cable <laughs> TV on 24 seven and everything. I just mm -hmm. don't know why this wasn't known or reported, but mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot of physical abuse there that was documented and, and, and brought to court and addressed by the police. So it was on public record that people weren't aware of leading into that. So, once we learned that, it was easy to see that this could have been the next step and this is the type of person that he was. Now, Doc here brings up a good analogy. Actually, Bill Cosby at the time that all that came out about the way he was leading his life mm -hmm. uh, was something similar because basically everybody thought Bill Cosby was this great family man and he's this great guy and he's... Oh, yeah. I mean, I've seen some of the guy. shows in the past. I mean, they're pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, he's a very popular guy. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I, I just I just hate it because I mean we'll never like most of us watching, most of us here, I mean, we'll never even probably have and it's not just about money, but we'll we'll never even have a fraction probably of what those those guys have made, right? And and it's just it's not all about money, but it's just the fact that you you've had such a successful life and it's just there's no reason to just do anything like that. I mean, some people will say, you know, that you, you gain everything, right? You've got the fame, the money and all that, and you're still not happy. And that's just like, it, it just shows that money isn't everything. You could be poor, but as long as you have people that you that care about you and, you, and you're happy and, you, you know, and all that kind of stuff, there's love and all that with, you know, whether if you're married and your kids and your family members and all that stuff. I mean, sometimes it's all you need. It just goes to show that even though these people had a lot of money, their lives were still broken. They were still messed up. And, and as people themselves, they were messed up. And I just think that, it just goes to show that it just money is not the cure. It doesn't fix everything at all. Absolutely, sir. We appreciate I mean, you're you probably being about here. to get off though. Can I, if you don't mind, can I ask one question about Absolutely. football though? That's sure. current. You you had uh, Curtis Rourke for Indiana, I think, one in your Big Ten uh, video. He was ninth, I think, if I recall. I believe eight, but you eight. might be right. Eighth or ninth, somewhere in that range. But uh, I saw somebody on Twitter have a Big Ten quarterbacks ranking. They had Curtis Rourke at number fourteen, and I'm like, "You're really, you're really not giving Indiana any credit here." Have you seen what he did at Ohio? Almost eight thousand passing yards. I mean, come on, like they had court Alex Orgy like at ten. I'm like, you got him four spots ahead of Curtis Rourke, and he might end up being way better. But really, I mean, Indiana all the way down to 14, but I mean, I, I'm really liking the way with Indiana 
you know, the way they're looking. I mean, just as of now, I guess my only question is, if you had to make a guess right now, yes or no, do you think Indiana is more likely to make a bowl game or not based off everything you've seen so far? I know it's impossible, but. Who are their three non-conference games? Uh, they, they're they very easy. I mean, right now, because I'm thinking about OJ Simpson, they're not coming to me as of now, but I can look like really quick. They, they don't, they I know they're all anyone? easy. Uh, they're, they're super easy. Uh, it's like, I know they have, I think it's like Charlotte or something. So they don't have a Louisville kind of game. Yeah, they took Louisville off the schedule because they want to get to a bowl game a lot easier. I know that's the reason, which I know a lot of people are saying that's a cop out on Indiana's part, but it's just because of the fact they want to make a bowl. They got FIU, Western Illinois, and Charlotte, so they should be 3-0. and Okay, so they've got to go 3-6. and six. I'm leaning not going to a bowl game. <laughs> oh, okay. I get it, though. They, they do have Maryland at home, Nebraska at home, Purdue at home, at Michigan State, at UCLA. Okay. It, it, it's possible. I mean, if they yeah, can oh, steal yeah, that one is. in Pasadena, they can get the one in Pasadena, then I'd say it's likely. <laughs> Purdue, Michigan <laughs> State. Maryland, maybe. And then, yeah, out of UCLA, Maryland, Nebraska, one of mm-hmm. those three, that gets into At Northwestern, too. At oh, Northwestern. Northwestern. It's definitely possible. Okay. Yeah, they got Washington at home. That That's that's kind of tough. I mean, you would probably say a loss there, but it's it's not impossible either. No, it's, I wouldn't be shocked if they pulled off an upset against Washington at home. Yeah, it'd be fantastic though if they could make a bowl game. I just want them to. I mean, I would prefer just to go six and six, play a max school in in the quick lane bowl, and just get a win so they could say they want a bowl game for the first time since '91. I mean, just they just got to do it. That uh, <laughs> that doesn't leave too many more games in the Big Ten. Who do they play out of the heavy hitters? They have Michigan and Ohio State. That's it. Okay. No so USC. They- no Penn State. They're Don't one worry. of the few teams in the conference that has improved, at least for one season, improved their schedule situation. Yeah, and they've improved the roster, too. I mean, it, it got the coach. It, it's possible. I mean, I've seen maybe six and six, seven and five. Uh, I mean, like I said, we're so far out, and I know it's crazy to ask now, but I just I just wanted to ask real quick because, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm liking what I'm seeing from Indiana in the off season, I think they've done a lot to improve the offense. The wide receiver room's looking really good. The quarterback position's looking great because they got three legitimate options there, even if it's not Curtis Rourke. And, I mean, the schedule, th- this is like the most manageable schedule I've seen Indiana have in, in forever because they're not in the Big Ten East anymore. Like, it's definitely manageable. If they don't make a bowl game with this – I'm not Kurt, Kurt Signetti's fine. He's not going to get fired or anything, obviously. But it would be disappointing to me. They're over under five and a half. So, like the Big Ten Vegas line, like the betting lines for the Big Ten are saying that Indiana is right on the cut line. It's five and a half. So it's either five and seven or six and six is what they're thinking. Yeah. So I was just going to say, to be more specific, now that I'm looking at their schedule and I've counted the possible wins, I will say that if I were a betting man, mm-hmm. that I would probably lay a even wager that they will be playing for a bowl game against Purdue. I mean, that's very well possible. And if you remember, there was two years back to back, back, I think it was, was it 2017 and 2018 where they were five and six and Purdue was five and six and Indiana played in both years and they lost by one score. And I watched both those games. I was like, no against Purdue Five and six, five and six, and they lost. And they went five and seven, and Purdue got to go to a bowl game. And I'm like, it's because their schedule was easier. They, they weren't as tired coming into the game against Indiana. Well, now I don't know what Purdue's schedule is, but I think theirs is harder than Indiana. So if Indiana beats Purdue this year, there might be some validity to that tough schedule thing because Indiana's schedule is easier. Two of three of Purdue's non-conference games are Notre Dame and Oregon State. Ooh. Well, I mean, Oregon State could be winnable because of all their losses, but Notre Dame, I mean, wow. Ooh, that's not good. 
They've got Nebraska, Wisconsin, Illinois, Oregon, Northwestern, Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan State, Indiana. Their schedule seems a bit harder than Indiana. I mean, because if you include the non-conference and then the fact they have Penn State as well as Oregon like that, and I think you said Michigan or Ohio State is one of the two, that, that's harder than Indiana's. Yeah. There so, it is. It's going to be interesting. I, I, I'll be fine with that. Five and six, five and six. And if Indiana can get the win, get to a bowl game, that would be really cool. But thanks for taking my call, Mark. Appreciate uh, looking at Indiana's schedule. I know we're so far out, but I can't wait for football season. I know the UFL is on, but most people don't care about that. I, I watch it. But it's going to be interesting with football coming back around. And that's when the voice of college football, that's when everybody's in the chat, everybody's coming back around. And it's always fun being in here when there's tons of people and all the – got the trolls, the regulars. It's always cool. But everybody like and subscribe to the voice of college football. Rest in peace to O.J. Simpson. Whether you love him or hate him, it's just an unfortunate situation. But thanks for taking my call, Mark, and hope you have a good one. Thank you, Jeffrey. Appreciate it. You too. All right, folks. Uh, that about does it. Again, O.J. Simpson dead at the age of 76. Uh, if you missed most of the live stream, especially the first half hour or so with Matt Zemek from Trojans Wire, you will want to take that in. We appreciate you being here at the Voice of College Football. And again, Let's keep in mind that starting next Monday, that there will be a different type of Voice of College football show. We hope you will be with us each and every morning for Wake Up College Football starting on tax day, April 15th at 8 a.m. Eastern time. Eastern time. I'm going to make it out of bed and join all of you, and we're going to look through the headlines. We've got a few other things planned that are much different than what we do on a regular basis here at the Voice of College Football. So thank you once again. And I see the greetings being given to OJ. Again, uh, I don't shy away from making the truth be known, even though this is not a uh, spiritual channel. We don't know where OJ is right now. We don't know. We have a strong indication. We have a strong indication, but we don't know. See you next time.